Okay. The webinar is now live. Hello everyone that is joining. We'll just give it a minute for folks to come in. Thank you everyone that's joining. We'll just give it maybe one more minute before we get started. Hello everyone that's joining now. We're going to get started in maybe 30 seconds. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Looks like, yes. Okay, so hello to everyone that has joined. We are so glad that you're here tonight. My name is Kelly Cobb. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the VP of giving at Bombas. I'm so glad to be able to host this discussion tonight around the intersection of sustainability, food insecurity, farming, and homelessness. If you've joined us before, you may agree that an hour never quite feels like enough to get into the complexities within these topics, but I do feel encouraged knowing that this won't be the last time we're discussing them. We're committed to continuing to have conversations like these and inviting you all, our team, our customers, our community to be part of it. This is still fairly new to Bombas, and I'm not sure how much longer I'll say that for. This is our fifth in an ongoing speaker series, so new-ish, but I think we're, we're starting to get the hang of it, and so glad to see some repeat faces here, or repeat names at least. We'll continue to host one every month, digging into the many topics that intersect with homelessness, so we hope you'll keep coming back to learn with us. Let's get into tonight's topic. We have with us some experts in the space of food insecurity, sustainability, farming, and food rescue. These topics often intersect with homelessness and we're going to be learning more about the ways that they're closely related and how paying attention to one of these areas can have a positive impact on another. During this past year, many of us routinely probably saw footage of exceptionally long lines at food distribution centers and mobile food pantries. For many folks, they have to make a hard decision about how they could most effectively spend their money on clothing for themselves or their family, on things like rent, food, and other necessities. Food distribution programs are often able to help in a significant way, allowing individuals to allocate budget to other needed areas. From many of our partners, we heard that the need was just outsized and that trend hasn't yet slowed down. But the good news is that with the help of incredible organizations and initiatives like the ones our panelists represent tonight, significant actions are being taken and true change is being made. That's another thing I feel very encouraged by. So let me introduce them to you. I'm so pleased to welcome our panelists. First, Brian Kabanban, the Senior Director of Partnerships at Rethink Food. Brian was born and raised in the Philippines where big meals and singing are a staple in most households. Brian started his professional career as a market researcher for Saatchi and Saatchi. In 2006, he made a life-changing move to the US where his career in sales and partnerships began. Prior to joining Rethink Food, Brian was with the Boy Scouts of America for 13 years and was instrumental in developing strategic partnerships on top of raising revenue through media, event, and sponsorship sales for the organization. Brian joined Rethink in 2020 and now leads the team responsible for engaging like-minded brands and corporations with the goal of raising funds and building impactful partnerships. Next, we have Mars Ballantyne, the founder and developer of nycfridge.com. Mars has been involved in food recovery for about a decade across different communities and organizations, including the Food Recovery Network, Food Not Bombs, and Rescuing Leftover Cuisine. They helped lead and develop Flower City Pickers, the largest all-volunteer food recovery organization in Rochester, New York. 
Last spring, when New York City mutual aid organizations started, started creating community fridges, they saw that there was a need for community members and volunteers to easily find information about the fridges. Mars's day job is in software engineering, so they created a map as a side project with the goal of partially filling that need. As of today, there is a current fridge count of 118 community fridges across the boroughs of New York City and Jersey City too. Pretty amazing. And Kathy Snyder is here. She's the founder and executive director of Rolling Harvest in Pennsylvania. Following a sales career in broadcasting as a Philadelphia native and food justice advocate, Kathy spent 14 years living overseas and raising her family in Europe and Asia before returning home and beginning her social impact journey. Awakened to the depth of food insecurity while volunteering at a local food pantry in the tourist area of New Hope, Pennsylvania, she realized that there is an untapped resource in the local agricultural community to help fill that nutrition gap faced by most food pantries. Organizations use limited budgets and growing customer base make it ever more challenging to provide nutritious, high quality food. So she reached out to some local farmers and in just a few short years, Kathy has grown Rolling Harvest Food Rescue from an initial connection between one pantry and one farm to a vibrant network of volunteers, farms, and food producers for hunger relief sites. Kathy is committed to raising awareness about the hidden face of local hunger, food waste, and insecurity, and offers leadership through public speaking engagements on actions that we can all take to nourish our neighbors in need. And I'm looking forward to learning more about those specific action items. I think most of us are probably curious. So I'd love for you all, our great audience, to get to know a bit more about our panelists beyond these introductions. This is a question that I love to start with, knowing that so much of where we're at now is thanks to our own individual journeys. So I'd love for each of you to tell us a little bit about what got you to where you are now. Brian, let's start off with you and then we'll hear from Mars and Kathy. Sure, no, Kel Kelly, thank you so much. And it's such an honor to be here uh, with Kathy and Mars as well, um, great organizations. So as, as Kelly mentioned, I was born and raised in the Philippines and I didn't know what food insecurity was. Um, I didn't know the concept. I didn't know what that meant, uh, but I did see it firsthand. And fortunately, you know, my family didn't experience it that much, but it was everywhere. It was everywhere. And there's this uh, thing in the Philippines called pug pug. So pug pug is a Tagalog word. Pug pug is um, like you, you dust off dirt from your shirt, for example. But it's a concept right now that's used in the Philippines because a lot, of, um, a lot of communities right now who are really struggling, what they do is they rummage through trash or garbage for half-eaten food, uh, for spoils. And what they do is they collect that and then they repurpose it. They cook it again and then sell it at a very, very cheap price. Not very, very nutritious, not very healthy, but it's, it, it's, it's a necessity for a lot of um, people within the communities that are really struggling. Um, so I knew about food insecurity, even though I didn't know what that meant. Um, and then in my early 20s, I moved to the United States and I said, developing economy, there probably be no food insecurity here. And lo, lo and behold, it's still there. Everywhere you go, food insecurity is a reality. Um, so my journey started uh, with, with you know, social impact and, and uh, nonprofit was when I joined uh, the Boy Scouts of America. Um, but as everyone knows, you know, even if you're not a foodie, food, you have an affinity to food because if you don't eat, you die. Um, but, but for me, coming from a culture that, you know, you walk into a Filipino household, there's only always two things, right? It's either singing or, or eating. Um, so when I found Rethink Food and I thought it was a perfect fit because I, I love what they were doing. I love what they're doing. It's very, it, it, the concept is not new, but the way they were doing things was, was, was pretty, pretty unique. And I was very excited. I was given the opportunity um, to join uh, the organization. That was in 2020. I now lead uh, the partnerships team. Uh, and we're very excited because we cannot do what we do without great partners and individuals. So um, thank you for having us here. And I'm excited to continue the conversation. Thanks, Brian. Mars, same question to you. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess, so I grew up in Vermont on a garden. Um, I was gardening uh, pretty much as soon as I could walk. 
Um, so I kind of grew up very much with the idea that in the summer and the fall, then you had you know this huge abundance of fresh vegetables and fruits that were flowing through your garden. And in the winter, then you know you ate the things that you can during the summer. Um, and you know if you had extra, then you would give them to your neighbors. And then in the winter, when you had less fresh vegetables and your neighbors that maybe you know had some goats that wanted some of your pickled vegetables, um, you know, that said, hey, can you give me a can of you know pickled green beans um, and I'll give you some of my goat cheese. And um, so I very much grew up with that concept. And I, um, you know, I didn't realize that like, it was kind of unusual. Um, and that, but essentially what that is, is mutual aid, is people have resources and they offer them up to other people um, you know, in exchange for the resources that those people have and just community sharing resources in this way. Um, so like, that was very normal to me. Um, and it wasn't until I got to college that I realized, oh, a lot of people didn't really grow up this way. And a lot of people didn't grow up having this you know, relationship and connection to where their food comes from. Um, and so that's when I kind of started um, you know, getting more involved with like, well, if there's this huge disconnect with this with a lot of people uh, you know, between where their food comes from and all, there's all this food being wasted um, and all these people that are going hungry. Um, so that's when I yeah, found the Food Recovery Network, um, which had a chapter um, at the college that I went to in Rochester. Um, so I spent, yeah, my five years at college, um, volunteering, you know, with the Food Recovery Network, and just getting to learn about other organizations in the Rochester area. Um, you know, like I joined Flower City Pickers, and um, you know that was just like an amazing experience of taking a small, scrappy group of volunteers to a legitimate nonprofit. Um, it was just like, um, you know, it was definitely a wild journey um, to be a part of, but um, you know, definitely gave me an appreciation for. Um, you know, how that process looks, um, you know, for, for different nonprofits and um, kind of like the different advantages of, you know, there's some things you can do as a large nonprofit and there's some things that you can do as a mutual aid organization and being able to look at it from both sides and seeing, you know, the benefits and different ways that they operate um, kind of brought me to where I am today, um, which is kind of like working more with mutual aid organizations, um, with the community fridge network, um, being able to fit in, you know, things where I can um, around my, around my full-time job. So yeah, that's pretty much. Thank you, Mars. Kathy, tell us a bit about the journey that got you to where you are now. You want the true story? Really? Let's I got hear. fired from a volunteer job. Do you want to hear about it? It's true. It's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do like this story because I think it, it goes to show that we as human beings are, are pretty darn resilient. And sometimes when we stumble, sometimes when we fall and get bloody knees, we, uh, we can pick ourselves up and collect ourselves and, and really have defining moments. So I was volunteering at a food pantry in beautiful, prosperous Bucks County, near right in the tourist Mecca of New Hope, PA, a wedding destination, people coming from all over the country in what I still believe is the wealthiest country in the world. And boy, did my eyes get opened really quickly. I didn't know a lot about food insecurity. I knew all about the food pantry model. I had always just accepted it as part of our culture, part of our society. I had always figured that, well, it's a well-run functioning society. Government does what it can and that can, and then Private sector fills in the gaps. That's uh, kind of how it's supposed to be. But what I saw was such inequity, such inexplicable deprivation from what I took for granted because what I didn't realize, and this is a decade of learning and peeling back the layers and, and learning, you were talking about the true face of food insecurity, the true face of of hunger. I, um, I had always just taken it for granted. I had two things. I had some disposable income and I had a car in a suburban area that doesn't have much in the way of public transportation at all. And the more I started to realize from what I was seeing with my own eyes through volunteering at this food pantry, I was eating so much better than the people I was serving. My kids were eating so much better. We would have these wonderful um, nourishing, delicious 
dinners, you know, family bonding time around the table. And I keep going back to the food pantry and we'd be giving out crap and I couldn't understand. Isn't this supposed to be the wealthiest country? Didn't I just go to a farmer's market a quarter mile away where there's, I don't know. I mean, it looked like thousands of pounds of stuff that wasn't going to be bought that day. So that's how it started. That's how it started. I got fired from that volunteer position because I was getting pretty um, um, opinionated about how things maybe could be so much better. And I just decided to do it. We need that feistiness and those strong opinions. That's, that's And clearly it has led to incredible change, which I'm excited to come back to. Um, but first, Mars, I, I know you said some of your early initiatives started as scrappy efforts. NYCbridge.com is far from scrappy. It's an amazing resource that you developed. Tell us about it. How has it evolved since you first created it? And what do you think has been some of the greatest and unexpected outcomes? Yeah, so, um, so I initially created the first version of the site in, I wanna say, yeah, it was July of last year. Um, so at that point, then I think there were about, well, already about um, 20 or 30 community fridges in New York City at that point. And I had been active with the Green Point Fridge um, run by North Brooklyn Mutual Aid. Um, for a few months and kind of keeping an eye on what the other what the other mutual aid organizations and other neighborhoods were talking about and what their needs were um, and what i was finding was that a lot of the location sharing of fridges was done through lists that were um, compiled into instagram posts and then you had to if you want to find the location of a fridge you had to go to the instagram post and then you know copy the location since it wasn't text it was an image and then you know, copy the location to Google Maps if you want to be able to find it. So, um, so I started talking to some of the organizers of the different fridges and saying, you know, is there is there a better way to do this? Can we have like a list of the locations? Is there would, would a map be helpful? Um, you know, and I got a very positive response to that. They're like, yes, a map would be very helpful. Um, so I started. I think it was on um, the initial prototype of the map. Um, I just sat down in like one weekend in July. And I was like, okay, this is going to be like a weekend project while I, um, I was learning a new, um, so the, the language that the, um, the app is built in, so it's built in um, JavaScript and, and React specifically. So I was, I was learning that technology at the time. So I'm just like, okay, I'll build this website as a way to practice this new technology. Um, and then I sent it to, um, yeah, some different people in North Brooklyn Mutual Aid, just like, you know, try this out for a few days, um, see how it works. And then they're like, okay, we love it. Um, here's the additional things that we want. Um, so then it kind of grew from there. And um, you know, each time that I sent out the new iteration, then I would I would get somebody that's like, oh, can we add in, you know, a check-in feature? Can we add in the ability to edit fridges by ourselves? Can we leave notes? Can we like take pictures with the check-in? Um, so it was very much like an iterative design process, um, which was like it was really cool to see that being implemented. Um, kind of like very, very fast paced um, and, you know, kind of like not having um, and you know, not having like a set guide of like what what exactly was supposed to what it was supposed to be, but figuring that out along the way as I was observing, you know, how how these interactions were happening, what people needed and getting the input directly from people. Um, so the last major edit that I did was the ability to um, change fridge details, since that was something that people told me um, was especially needed during the winter when you had a lot of fridges that had to move indoors because of the cold. Um, so maybe if they moved inside a business, then, um, then, then the hours might change. Maybe it was only available for a certain, um, certain hours of the day because you know, the business is closed the rest of the time. Uh, or maybe they had to change locations. Um, so that was like one of the last major updates uh, that I made. Um, so since then, it's been kind of, I guess, um, in a kind of maintenance um, state while I've been figuring out the next big, um, big updates. But um, since, since, since then, people have been able to add fridges um, as they kind of come online and edit them whenever the details change. Um, and I guess like the most, um, yeah, the greatest unexpected outcome, I didn't really 
know this is going to happen, um, it's been like a pleasant surprise, is the number of um, students and teachers that have been doing school projects on food and security that have reached out to me to like ask questions about, you know, like, how did you find out about these different community fridges and um, like, yeah, asking, asking all these questions about how do I, how do I get the information on this fridge? How do I contact, um, you know, the different, different organizers of this fridge? And uh, some of them have been like elementary or middle school students that have told me, um, I love reading emails from students. Um, it is honestly like one of the, one of the best parts because um, they'll be telling me that they're, they've been helping their parents, you know, take care of the fridge or cook meals for the fridge. Um, then they'll be asking me, um, you know, like I want to know if there are other, if there are other kids that are doing this in other neighborhoods. Um, and then I can tell them, it's like, yes, there are kids in the Bronx that are, you know, cooking meals for the fridge, just like you are in Brooklyn. Um, and also a number of middle school and high school students that have been like interested in, you know, learning how to code that have reached out to me and asked like, you know, how do you get started with, you know, taking your coding and applying that to a real world project that actually, you know, can do some good. Um, so it's been, that's been like a really rewarding but kind of unexpected outcome, I guess. Wow. I mean, just that, that level of connectivity and, and to see how the power of it has just grown so exponentially. And just in case our audience doesn't know exactly what a community fridge is, could you just tell us exact? I know it might vary from fridge to fridge, but give us a sense of, of what a community fridge looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so community fridge is generally a publicly available fridge that's placed um, generally outside. But like I said, there's some, some reasons why I'm with the inside. Um, so, you know, you do need a business um, that like has access to an outside power outlet that's like willing to be a host for the fridge. Um, but we've been really fortunate in New York City, especially to have like so many bodegas and cafes and grocery stores um, that are willing to say, you know, sure, I'll spend the extra 20 bucks of electricity on a month, a month to keep this fridge running. Um, and it's been, it's just been incredible seeing the way they've kind of been popping up um, to these different boroughs, because really all you need to start a fridge is a, a person that's willing to be a host, um, a mutual aid organization, or even just a couple of community volunteers that are able to maintain it. Um, and then just the fridge itself, which, you know, a lot of people have been finding on like Facebook marketplace, Craigslist on the side of the road. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's really been incredible the ways that people have kind of taken different approaches. Um, to seeing how they can best serve their community with the fridge. Um, like there's some, there some fridges that are in, um, you know, certain communities that are halal fridges. So then, you know, it's like they say on their guidelines and on the site that we only, you know, we only want to have halal food in this fridge, so please only leave halal food here. Or the same thing with, with kosher food. Um, and so because it's very autonomous and decentralized and each fridge is maintained by the community members, then the community is really determining what works best for them. Um, and it's not, you know, some other organization that's saying, you know, you must have your community fridges operate this way and you must have, um, you know, people doing these, these shifts at these times. It's really up to the community to make that decision. And um, yeah, so I guess, I think in New York, New York City, I think we have the highest density um, of fridges because we have, you know, like you said, 100, 117 fridges, I think, over just a few square miles. Um, but that is definitely a growing movement. Um, I know that there's plenty of fridges that have started in California and plenty um, yeah, in Boston and cities all across, um, all across the country and across the world. Um, so it really is just a place where people can leave extra food if they have it. Um, so it is often a place where if somebody is doing a food recovery, but they don't necessarily have a designated um, shelter or um, other place or food pantry to bring it to, then they know that they can leave it at the fridge and it'll still be appreciated by somebody. Um, and something that's been really cool to see is the number of people that will um, cook meals and then you know, cook a big batch of soup and then portion out the soup into Tupperwares and then leave that at the fridge. And um, you know, so different groups have different guidelines, um, you have volunteers that will check to make sure that, you know, there's nothing that has been in the fridge for longer than, you know, five days. So all ingredients have to be labeled and dated and everything. Um, but it's just been like really incredible to see the ways that people can, you know, recognize that like, oh, I have a bunch of food. 
um, but it's not really quite enough to, you know, feel like I should bring it to a, a food pantry because, you know, it's, maybe it's not the right type of food. Maybe, you know, it's, it's too little for them to accept. Maybe it's a random assortment of stuff that I'm cleaning out my kitchen. And I just found all this stuff that I don't know what to do with. They can just bring it to the community fridge. And um, it's just been like really, yeah, really incredible. So incredible. And I, I love the idea that you touched upon this idea of localization and the self-governing nature of it that really helps the communities be autonomous and do what's best for, for their community. I think this idea of connectivity and, and fast-paced iteration is revealing itself as a common theme throughout this chat. Uh, Bombas first got connected to Rethink Food at the beginning of the pandemic. Brian, your organization recognized a need and acted quickly to launch Rethink Certified. Will you tell us more about that and the silver lining of creating a program that was truly born out of a crisis? Sure. No, thank you for that question, uh, Kelly. Uh, so we actually started in 2017. So we're still considered a startup. We started out um, as a food rescue organization. What we did was we collected uh, a lot of food excess from different food purveyors. And then we repurposed that food excess uh, utilizing our commissary kitchen. And then we dis distributed them through community-based organizations or CBOs for short. Um, but yes, you're right. When the pandemic hit, we had to pivot because you know, the commissary kitchen was doing well. It, we were, we were you know, preparing and distributing meals about 5,000 to 8,000 meals a week. But that was not enough, especially when the pandemic hit. So what we did was, was we created a, this program called Rethink Certified. And it basically, um, it, it, it has two purposes. Of course, one is to feed the communities. But the second one is to make sure that we keep the restaurants in business. So the concept is very simple. So what we do is uh, we look at communities that are food deserts. We look at communities that have high um, you know, instances of food insecurity. And then we build a relationship with a community-based organization in that community. And once we built that relationship with the CBO, we go around that CBO and look for restaurants that are struggling or restaurants that could help us out with the preparation of meals. So once we've determined and pinpointed those restaurants that we think would be a good fit for the Rethink Certified program, um, we bring them in as a Rethink Certified restaurant. We provide them with a grant so that that helps them keep their operations moving and keep people hired. Um, and in return for that grant, they will prepare meals for us. So they will cook meals using you know, their excess, uh, excess ingredients. And at the same time, just add a little bit more, you know, uh, extra ingredients on top of that, then they can produce meals. Some restaurants produce meals. Um, maybe it's like 500, 500 a week. Some, some of them produce about 2000 a week. Uh, so we currently right now, we have about, um, I would say 70 restaurant partners. Uh, and we supported about 145 plus equivalent full-time jobs because of the program. Uh, we're partnered with about 180 plus community-based organizations. And to give you a scale, um, you know, since April 2020, when we started this program, we have distributed about over 3 million meals in total. Um, and that's over an investment of about $15 million into local communities. So once the restaurants who are part of the Rethink Certified program produce those meals, we take care of the logistics of it. We, we have, you know, um, we take care of the, the pickup, we take care of the delivery to the CBO, and then the CBO is responsible for distributing that to the communities. And the beauty, the, the beauty of, of this model is we can provide meals that are uh, with, with dignity and respect. And I know we talk about that all the time. We provide meals with dignity and respect, really nourishing meals, really nourishing meals. And at the same time, they can also be culturally uh, appropriate and culturally sensitive. So, you know, if you have a community that has high, uh, a population of Filipinos, and then, you know, there's a high, you know, instance of food insecurity there, we can partner with Filipino restaurants so that we can provide them um, with, you know, a culturally uh, relevant meal as well. So, so Rethink Certified is just one of, of our three main uh, programs, but, you know, just imagine, 5,000 meals a week from the commissary kitchen. And then because of the Rethink Certified program, we're about 88,000 meals per week. And we're not, we're not stopping. You know, our goal is uh, by the end of 2021, we're hoping to um, 
uh, prepare and, and distribute about 4.3 million meals and hoping to invest about $21 million. Um, so so we're, in, uh, we're in big scale mode. That's why we're always building partnerships and doing fundraising so that we can increase the impact. Um, and, um, and yeah, yeah, so thank you. My goodness, that is absolutely incredible. It, it's hard to... It's hard to know that the demand is that great and so encouraging to know that organizations like yours are are able to to scale to meet that need yeah. and you. this theme of acting locally and answering to your community's true needs similar to what mars was speaking about is is also so encouraging and i think on that topic of recognizing a theme and then acting swiftly we are often hearing from our customers and friends and family that they want to help and they see a need for a need to help, but they're often just not sure where to begin. Kathy, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your experience. You started Rolling Harvest after identifying a need in your community, after getting fired from your volunteer job and recognizing one way to help what started as that single connection between a food pantry and a farm has now grown exponentially. You have a thriving network that includes volunteers, farms and food producers, hunger relief sites. Will you tell us a little bit about what it felt like to put those initial pieces together, to make that initial connection, to speak out when you saw that there is a way that things could be done better? And how did you know where to begin? Uh, it's it's been extraordinary. It really has. And before another second goes by, can I just please acknowledge Brian and Mars and the amazing work you're doing in your communities. I am so there are so many silver linings. We could we could talk for just two hours about silver linings of the absolute worst year in all of our lives and what we're going through, and all of this innovation and creativity and. And the layers being pulled back to, to show the truth of what is happening in our society. Uh, I just want to acknowledge all that before I answer your question that the work we're all doing, we've been doing it quietly kind of in the shadows for a decade. It's front page news. And with that is going to come funding for Brian's programs. And with that is going to come new refrigerators in the communities for Mars programs. And with that, um, and one of the greatest feelings to get back to your original question, Kelly, is I knew that what we were doing mattered. I knew that it was taking a situation that was just stupid and wasteful and making it a little less so. <laughs> that we were not going to cure hunger, but there's so much abundance. We're, I mean, it's the, it's the Garden State. It's New Jersey. It's rolling hills of Pennsylvania local agriculture. We're not going to cure hunger, but what we're going to do is going to go back and it's going to touch in to a couple of things that Brian and Mars uh, spoke about. Dignity, respect, targeting communities, culturally appropriate food. It all comes down to another thing that we take for granted. We have choices in what we can feed ourselves and our family. We can choose the foods we like. We can choose the foods that are not going to you know, make us uh, feel sick or give us um, aller allergic responses. We can choose the foods that are culturally significant to the neighborhoods we grew up in. And the percentage of people who don't have that is shockingly high. And that to me is the work we're all doing. And to hear it being done on Brian's level, Mars's level, Rolling Harvest Food Rescue, to say, Let's bring the farm market to the food pantry because this is beautiful stuff. It's going to get tossed. It's going to go in to pollute our landfills. How stupid is that in this time of global warming? Let's just support our local farmers more. Let's embrace that carrot with the wonky three vegetables because we're going to cut it up in a soup anyway. And you're going to give that farmer money and that farmer is going to be able to donate more and put more food into the supply chain. And the, the thing that has been almost most extraordinary of all of this, the original feeling that I was surprised by and that has not left me to this day is how much this means to our farmers. I just wanted to be able to provide, um, you know, spinach and kohlrabi and 
wonky, beautiful organic tomatoes that I knew were growing all around me and put that on the shelf in every food pantry in the shopping bags of everyone who comes with the choice model, very important that people get to shop and choose. So the way it felt from the beginning was, yeah, I knew this from in, in the fi every fiber of my being, because I had seen it, I had witnessed people coming in so vulnerable, so brave, asking for help, they should get the very best food that's out there. And then they're gonna be in a position to be stronger and healthier and better attention span at work and better attention span at school. They're gonna be able to get their lives back on track. But what it means to the farmers, especially the young organic farmers we work with, to not have anything left behind in the field just because they don't have the customer base or they don't have the staff. And they can literally, here, I'm gonna use a prop there. They literally send us a text message and within 24 hours, we can have 20 people in their fields rescuing that entire field of broccoli from going bad because it's gonna be 100 degrees. So I'm blown away by farmers. Farmers have now turned from just reaching out to us when they have excess to saying, guess what, Kathy, we've got excess land. We have an acre and a half we're not using. What would you like me to grow for you? What doesn't get donated? And then we get to provide the culturally appropriate foods, the collard greens, the jalapenos, the, you know, all of uh, the beets and, and cabbage for Russian and Eastern European, all of these varieties that have never really made its way into the charitable food system before. Sorry, that was a little long. I know it was, sorry. No, I, I mean, it could go on and on. There's just so much good here. The organic farmers, the three-legged carrots, the beauty of ensuring that everyone gets access to this beautiful food and are, that they're so deserving of. And I'm very interested to come back to this topic of dignity, the dignity of choice, which is so important and the importance of nourishment. But first, just to speak a little bit more to this topic of helping to break down the barriers to helping. Mars, you and I had an email conversation and you let me know that before nycfridge.com, you were once quite familiar with that struggle of wanting to help, but not knowing how exactly to get involved. And you kindly offered to weigh in on some approaches and philosophies that can help people break past that barrier. Let's get into that a little bit. Where, where does one begin? Yeah. Um... So I guess to go back to something that Kathy said, um, I think that often then people tend to think of like solving world hunger as like this huge goal of like, oh, you know, like we have to solve world hunger. And it's like, well, when you put it that way, then of course it seems insurmountable and, you know, completely impossible. Um, so I guess like in, instead of thinking of it as we're solving hunger, um, then really breaking it down to the more local day-to-day -day level of, what are we doing today um, to make sure that somebody that woke up food insecure is not going to bed food insecure? Um, and tackling it day by day, um, you know, thinking about what are you know what are some things that I can I can be doing, um, you know, to make that difference for even just that one person or for a family or for a group of families. And I think once you start thinking about it in those terms, then it becomes a lot more manageable. It becomes a lot easier to start looking around your community and seeing, you know, what, what is it that people really need? You know, they don't need me as an individual to solve world hunger, because I'm not going to do that. What they need is for people to listen to them and, you know, be willing to figure out like what it, what it is that they need today or tomorrow or next week. Um, and I think that's the barrier that I've seen, like a lot of people get caught in of thinking, um, oh, I don't know where to start. So I might as well just not start at all. And um, I think the thing that really helps with that is um, doing a lot of the research and asking questions. And it can be hard to do that research of finding these different organizations. Um, but I think it's like really important to consider um, questions like, what causes am I passionate about? And what type of organizational structure for volunteering fits best for me? Do I, do I work better when I can do a long nine hour Saturday volunteering shift in a nonprofit? Do I work better when I can you know, squeeze in an hour at the food pantry after work on a weekday? Um, do I work better, you know, when I'm going into something, you know, with a group of strangers or when I'm, you know, just doing something with just my family or just my friends? And I think once people start answering those questions, um, 
then it becomes a lot easier for them to find those opportunities to be like, yeah, I can do that. I can, I can spend this Saturday, you know, going to, going to help out of my food pantry. I can, I can spend this Saturday, um, you know, making sure that my neighbors all have, all have lunch today. Um, and I guess just seeing, being able to see that um, firsthand um, with Flower City Pickers um, was definitely like really, really amazing. Um, so we worked directly at the public market in Rochester, which is the largest, one of the largest open air markets um, in New York. And so we had people that would be walking by constantly, often entire families, and the kids would be asking like, what are you doing? Why are you sorting all that food? What are you, where are you taking that food? Um, and like, you know, we'd, we'd tell, we'd, we'd answer the kids, um, you know, we're taking it to homeless shelters and soup kitchens, and they're going to serve it up to people that need it. And then the kids would be like, oh, that sounds fun. Can I join? Um, and then, you know, they'd stay maybe for 20 minutes, maybe for two hours. Um, and they just have, have a lot of fun sorting food. And um, then they leave and sometimes they come back and sometimes they don't. But just for that afternoon, they were able to be part of something. And I think that that's really the part that people get stuck on is thinking that it has to be, oh, I have to make this recurring commitment. And it has to be this whole, you know, huge deal when often it's just as simple as showing up. Um, you know, making those connections, asking those questions, um, see somebody volunteering, you know, or if you know somebody that volunteers at food pantry, you can ask them, you know, wh what are the shifts like? Is there a shift that I could pick up? Um, you know, are there other food pantries that you work with? Um, or if, you know, if you're interested in other stuff that's kind of outside of, um, you know, food insecurity, then asking what other organizations do you know of? Because um, I find that a lot of times and people that are active in food recovery organizations, are also active in stewardship organizations and um, you know homelessness advocacy and all these other things. Um, like I know that in New York City, then a lot of the community gardens um, partner with um, groups that do TNR um, for the feral cat colonies that live in the gardens. Um, so like the number of people that have come up to me while I've been working in the garden to ask me, oh, do you know anything about the feral cat colony that lives here and about the people that do that TNR stuff? And I'm like, yeah, I can I can give you their email. Um, so being able to just know what the questions are that you want to ask and being willing to ask those questions to kind of get your foot in the door of like, don't be afraid to ask questions. And when you see somebody doing something that you, you know, it looks cool, but you don't really know what they're doing, then ask them like, are you doing this as part of an organization? You know, how do I, how do I sign up? Um, yeah, I found that that's often the best way um, to kind of get past that initial awkward stage of, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's kind of, yeah, my answer to that. Completely agree. And I, I think so often, maybe folks that haven't had that opportunity yet seem to think that there's this, this group of people that have all the answers or have had all the experience and that they're kind of like in on the secret. But you're right, it, it does just start with asking, asking the questions and getting connected. And people are so happy to lend their experience and, and connections and, and help someone get involved. I mean, I love the example you gave about once some students found out about the nycfridge.com and like wanting to get involved more and more students started emailing. And it's just, I think once you get that one connection and sometimes it's easy to go into it with a buddy and just knowing that you've got this other person in it with you and you know, it helps to empower you a bit, but I love all of your suggestions. I, I think that's exactly where it starts. It isn't more complicated than that. Uh, but let's get back to the topic of dignity because this is such an important one. We we all want a dignified experience and are deserving of one no matter. Sorry, my cat is destroying a book on my desk. Um, is deserving of one no matter what our current circumstances are. Let's chat more about Rethink Cafe and the model that has been built there. Brian, will you tell us a bit more about this concept and the impact that it's had on the community? Sure. No, thank you, Kelly. Um, so Rethink Food started Rethink Cafe March 2020, just in the middle, of, just when it started, when everything was shutting down, that's when the cafe opened. And it's in uh, 154 Clinton Avenue. It's in Brooklyn. That's our very first one. Um, and uh, the Rethink Cafe is actually a registered soup kitchen. Uh, and it's really one of the first few pay what you can cafes in, in the city. It was very interesting because, you know, it you can come in with a with uh, with five dollars, suggest a donation of five dollars and you can get a really nourishing meal. If you come in without any dollars, you can still get 
a complete nourishing meal. Um, and it's a beautiful space. So when it comes to serving the community, serving um, you know, people within the community and stuff, dignity and respect is very important. So with that in mind, we wanted to make sure that the cafe is a beautiful space, a very welcoming space, an inclusive space. People can come in, uh, they can come in and buy, you know, um, so we've got people within the community who would come in and, you know, buy a meal or two and then just tack on $20 on top of that because they know that all of the money that we get from the cafe goes back to the program. And then it also helps fund, um, you know, those uh, those individuals who, who come in who can only give a dollar. And if they wanted to give two dollars, of course, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're welcome to do that. And that gives, you know, that enhances the experience. It provides them with an opportunity to also enhance the concept of what dignity and respect is all about. Um, and what's amazing about this is, you know, we have this thing called the Share the Love campaign. Um, you know, uh, the uh, executive director of operations started that within, you know, within the cafe. And then that's, that's basically it. You come in, you buy a meal, you can buy another meal, pay it forward, you share the love. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting, too, because we have a pantry at, 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 the, uh, at the cafe. And the pantry, um, you know, it, one of our pain points, really, it's, it's one of the things that's hard, really, for a pantry is to have consistent uh, consistency. You know, you want people who, who, you know, who rely on that pantry to know that when they come in, they can get, you know, shelf stable items that, that, okay, I can get ingredients for soup. But that's one of the pain points that we have. Where, and how can we provide that consistency within that pantry? But we do have that there. Uh, we, we do have that pantry. We, and what's amazing about the cafe too is um, the meals are prepared by, by chefs and it's prepared on site. And 80 to 100% of the meals come from donated um, ingredients. Uh, and because we still have, remember the commissary kitchen that I mentioned earlier, the commissary kitchen is still operating. We still produce about five to 8,000 meals a week. Um, and the food that we get from donations, we got you know, different food purveyors who are providing us with, uh, with and, you know, excess ingredients. And uh, that's what we use. And it's amazing because within the cafe or even the commissary kitchen, it's just like, you know, it's an episode of chop because we have regular protein that come in. For example, we've got consistent um, uh, donation of salmon, but then sometimes we have parsley, sometimes we don't. You know, sometimes we have this certain, you know, we, we get mushrooms, sometimes we don't. So imagine our chefs in the commissary kitchen and the cafe thinking about, okay, these are the ingredients, what do we do? And that happens on the spot. And it's amazing. It's because of that dedication too, to make sure that what we're serving um, is, 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 is high quality and high nutrient and, and then provides, you know, a space where people can come in whether they have the means or not to come in and, and get a nourishing meal and get it with uh, dignity and respect. So, um, you know, there are a lot of plans on in expanding uh, and it's, it's just interesting to see uh, the, the support that we get within the community because think about it, uh, we have about, I would say, two types of, of, of audiences or customers that go to the cafe, those who buy the meal and then add more because they know the model really goes back to the program and those who come in because they need that help, right? So, so we got those two things uh, going on. And, um, and what's amazing about this is we were, so, so I was there in front of the cafe a few weeks ago with a few of, of our colleagues with, in Rethink Food. And then a gentleman comes in uh, he was driving a truck. He comes in, parks it a little bit, and then comes in and comes out with three bags, one for himself and two for his coworkers. And he goes, are you guys from, from here? It's like, what is this? What, what is Rethink Cafe? And we, we told him about it. He says, I've been coming here, and I knew that you guys were doing great. He said, because I can go out and buy a $15 meal, and it's not as good as this $5 meal. And he said, I've been, I bought this for my core because I know that this $5 goes a long way. Um, so it's, it's interesting because we only started that cafe in March 2020, and we're getting some good uh, feedback from the community. And we hope that we can you know, continue doing more and expand uh, more within the city. Such an incredible model and, and such a beautifully sustainable one. And I, I love that element of surprise from someone that, you know, didn't quite know what they were supporting. And I, I hope that we can see more and more cafes like this around the city and, and to be able to impart that sense of dignity is just so beautiful. 
And, and with sustainability in mind, um, sustainable farming practices we know can have a direct impact on food insecurity. So Kathy, I have a couple questions for you. What does it mean for the communities you bring these farm markets to? Why is bringing this fresh, healthy food to food insecure communities so important? And we do have a question from the audience from Griffin, and, and maybe this is part of your response. He's wondering how you would describe the importance of private generational farming versus institutional farming to help combat food insecurity. So that and you know, what, what is the importance of bringing such nutritious food to the communities you serve? Sorry. Sorry. It goes back to exactly what Brian and Mars and Kelly, what you're talking about. It's dignity, it's choice, and it's showing people respect for whatever their own tastes and preferences might be. And it's not that we don't have enough food that we need to sacrifice that and give junk and empty calories to people. The whole point is it's just diverting all of this food that's in our abundantly wasteful system. So it means everything to the people that can have, um, when we grow collard greens at, at, um, at an organic farm and we take it to uh, Trenton, New Jersey, you know, an area of tremendous poverty and density, fresh collard greens, people are reminded of their childhoods and there's, they're feeling joy. Uh, it could be watermelons, which we can't bring to, to people in diabetic populations, but imagine the tastes and the pleasures most of us associate with food. Aside from the fact that these are families who just are not even able to provide the basic needs. You, you're lifting someone's spirit. You're making sure that food's not going to landfill because of some stupid misconception about what's healthy and, and, and safe to give. Those, those, those um, old worn out uh, barriers have been turned on their head. So um, food is safe to donate in most cases and respectful to donate in most cases. So it means a lot. You're gonna have better health, health outcomes. The more varieties you eat, the fresher you eat. And it ties in with your second question from Griffin, which is, yes, we do mostly in the farms that we work with in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, I'm very happy to say, they're mostly all small family farms. We don't really have big agribusiness that personally that Rolling Harvest Food Rescue is working with. We work with about 45 farmers. Uh, maybe the smallest one is five acres. The largest one is maybe 400 acres. And believe it or not, that's small scale ag um, agriculture. Yet not all of it is organic. Many of it is organic practice. Uh, we seem to work especially hard to respond to the needs of organic farmers that we owe a debt of gratitude to because they are the ones doing such labor intensive, expensive work to ensure generations of healthy soil, healthy water, healthy air, restorative, regenerative agricultural practices that are going to enable us possibly to feed 9 billion people on this planet in less than a generation. All of these things can be tied in to, I want to I want to bring it back to what Mars was saying about little things that people can do. Everybody can play a part in making better food choices, behavioral nudges not to waste food, behavioral nudges to know where your farmers are. Is that possible in New York City, by the way? I hope it is. Uh, so, so many reasons that sustainable agriculture, first of all, requires all of us saying, we value this, it's important. If COVID taught us nothing else, remember when COVID first hit, people for the first time in their lives couldn't find eggs, couldn't find milk, couldn't find um, wheat to make, to make you know, bread. Bread was the big thing. Uh, it, it, opened the, it opened the way for an entire new generation of supporters for local farmers and their models. And it's tied in with keeping the planet healthy and benefiting us all. 
Absolutely. And I, I love these reminders of the things that we can do as individuals. I think also going back to something that Mars said about, you know, it, it feeling like we have to solve world hunger, but, you know, being able to scale it back and just think about are there, are there choices that we can make on a daily basis? How can we be a bit more thoughtful? And, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily hard to do. It's just the, that awareness. Um, we're almost out of time. We, I would love to just and with one last question, I guess, sort of a speed round for each of y'all, if there's one thing that you would hope that those who are watching will take away with them and maybe pass along to somebody else, what would that be? Kathy, let's go back to you and then Mars and Brian. Hug a farmer. Um. Yeah, I'd say um, if there's a problem that you want to solve, think of the baby steps um, and, you know, don't think of the huge whole problem. Think of um, what it is that's needed and how you can use your own skills and resources to be a part of the solution. Yeah, I, uh, for me, I think uh, it, it's understanding really what, what food insecurity is, right? Uh, I think by understanding uh, the issue, then we can come up with, with, with appropriate solutions. So yeah, you know, that, that food insecurity is more than just being hungry, right? So even though hunger and food insecurity are very close related, these are really two different concepts. So hunger is a physical sensation. You now food insecurity is on, on the other hand is, is a more complex phenomenon that occurs when, I don't know, when households don't have the resources to acquire adequate food. So, so you, it, it, and then it, it scales, there, the, you know, there's a scale to that. So it can be very, very hungry, but, but it can also be, it can manifest itself in, um, let's say you are a single parent and you worked just a, a 12 hour shift and you come home, you don't have time to cook. And all you can do is just go get a dollar pizza, for example, for the family. So that can be considered food insecurity as well. So I think it's just the understanding of what the issue is. Um, so we can come up with better and creative solutions, just like um, you know, what Kathy and Mars have, have done. And I'm very impressive by them and very honored to be, to be with you all today. You've all come up with such, such inspiring solutions to help approach this issue from a variety of, of different angles. And if there are any last questions from the audience, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I think, we I think we've answered. There was one question about nycfridge.com being open source Mars. Oh, I think I saw that question. Oh. Um, yeah, about there being a public API. Mm -hmm. Not yet, but that is hopefully the one of the next iterations. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to yeah, continuing to work with um, other developers that are interested in doing this work. That's super exciting. And I know that question came from one of our ambitious team members. So maybe there's opportunity to help support in some way. Um, okay, I think I think that's it then for tonight. The hour just flies by. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you to Brian, Kathy, and Mars, and for all of the incredible work that you do and for sharing with us. I could easily talk about it for another hour. We'll continue to have conversations like these once a month. If you want to share this conversation with somebody who wasn't able to be here tonight, you'll receive an email tomorrow with a link to the YouTube video or recording of the chat. So feel free to pass that on. And always feel free to reach out with, with feedback for future conversations. And we love, we love hearing from you. So thank you. I hope everyone has a great evening.